possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. And there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Right. It's over the bar. Hello, welcome to the RTE GA podcast. Mikey Stafford and Rory O'Neill with you as always. And we're joined by Conor McKeown of the Irish Independent and the Herald and by Liam Sheedy. How are you doing, gents? Good, Mikey. Very good, Mike. Very Mikey. Good. Very good. For those of you watching us, um, R- Rory looks like he's reporting from the front line in Kharkiv because he's uh, he's getting some work done on his house and he's yeah. uh, the, the builders of the Kango Hammers out, so he has to sit in his car. It did sound like the front line there for, 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 for a few minutes. Um, listen, it was a it was a hell of a weekend of GA lads. We have the um, uh, Connor's own Dublin footballers are four defeats from four games and facing down the barrel of relegation after finally being beaten by a team from Leinster for the first time in eleven years. Um, so we'll have Pat Spillane later to talk about football, but we're going to talk about hurling now because the all dominant Limerick hurlers are facing out a barrel of relegation. Nah, they're not. But they have lost three games in a row. Um, They did manage to not win any of their three game first games last year as well. Um, So I think we might start there because it was, Liam, it was an incredibly interesting game in the Gaelic grounds. Um, The results was interesting, particularly Cork's first half performance. But I think it would be remiss of us to start anywhere else but to start with the absolute outright aggression that was on display two red cards you could argue there could have been a few more um if it was a championship game you would have said it was heated but for a league game in the end of february it does seem that there is don't want to be too tabloid about it but it does seem like there's a bit of bad blood brewing between these two teams yeah look i i think obviously you know there was a few talking points last year when they met uh they're, they're probably mean it a, a fair bit too you know i think they met three times last year so like they're getting they're getting very used to each other. Um, and, you know, like Limerick really blew them away in the final match. You know, you maybe one would have thought after the match in the Munster semi-final that, you know, Cork might have been that far away if they came and got their tactics right in the day. But Limerick just came and steamrolled them uh, from the 15 minute on. And the, the game was really over at half time. So you can imagine as a Cork player and even as a Cork management team, I'm sure they spent all of the winter soul searching. You know, there was probably a lot of people that said, look, you didn't stand up to them. You didn't perform. You know, so I'm sure that was hitting fairly hard. So say going into the Gaelic grounds yesterday, they had a cause. I think they had a real cause. Um, and look at you know, I think you know Limerick are probably a little bit vulnerable. You know, I think losing three matches. I mean, Limerick Limerick drew and lost their first two. They drew the first game and, and lost the two following games. But they lost the two games in Pierce Stadium and then uh, Walsh Park. You know, and like Limerick went up or Cork went up. Not for the first time, and went into Limerick and beat them in their own in their own backyard. Because I remember when we beat we beat um, Cork in the first round in 2019, and you were saying, "God, you fear from the following week going to Limerick." It actually went and pulled the result in 2019 in round two of the of the of the championship. So you know they have they have good form against this team. You know they obviously got well beaten in the uh, in the All Ireland final, but you know I think they showed yesterday that they are a team that are. Are moving in the right direction. Um, Kieran Kingston nearly knows what he has now, and he's got good young talent coming through, you know. And I think he needs young talent coming through. But even I was even watching the exchange between Seamus Harnady and, and Jeremy Burns at the end of the match, and I just got the sense of I'm going to see you shortly soon again. So I think it's it's building nicely. I think Parky Cueve could be tested a, a few times in terms of confidence and everything and all else that they have going on down there this year or later on the year. But I'd say. In the middle of April, when these two go go head to head, I think we're 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 in for a bit of a uh, a sellout. I would say. Yeah, you could yeah, test okay. the foundations more than more than uh more than Ed Sheeran. Uh, Connor, it's probably been said for the last couple of years that to beat this Limerick team, you have to match them physically, which is an easy thing for the likes of us to say, but to actually be out there and do it is another thing. So. By no means condoning it, but when Sean Finn pretty much stood on Shane Kingston after he scored his second goal. The next chance Shane Kingston got, he illegally obviously tried to remove Sean Finn's head and got a red card for himself. Maybe it wasn't premeditated, maybe he wasn't thinking like that, but for the casual observer you look at it and say, you know, <laughs> these these Cork lads have decided they've had enough of uh, Limerick kind of imposing themselves on him. Yeah, and I think like like regardless of the, the maybe the incidents that came under the referees watch, I think just generally the way Cork played yesterday, you know, was the way that like last year going to the All-Ireland Final, there was a big talk about Cork's pace. And, you know, when you think about Cork playing well, you imagine them running in behind teams. And, and the fact of the matter was they just 
you know, you don't get to do that against Limerick because they don't give you any space to run in behind. Cork didn't try that yesterday. They actually fronted up and, and went, went at the battle around the middle third with, with Limerick's middle eight um, and generated a lot of the scoring chances. Like you saw the goals, one of them came from Patrick Horgan uh, catching the ball over Dan Morrissey. Um, like all through that 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 middle ground, and I t- like I saw a statistic towards the back end of last week. I can't remember who who wrote the piece or specifically what the statistic was, but it was about Cork's tackle count in last year's All Ireland final. And like I don't know for definite, but if you ask me to place a bet, I'd say they had that surpassed by half time yesterday in the Gaelic grounds. So they were they were winning a lot of rook balls, and um, they were stopping Limerick creating scoring chances from those breaks. And like no team has ever sort of created as many scoring chances. Um, from winning rooks as Limerick before. Um, I thought Jerry Millerick, particularly in the first half, did a great job on Kane Lynch. And I thought young um, Kieran Joyce did a brilliant job um, on Tom Morrissey back there as well. So, you know, even in terms of the one on one battles, um, you know, they, 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 they physically impose themselves on the, game, on the game in a way which they weren't able to do in last year's All Ireland final. So, you know, even afterwards, like we spoke to Kieran Kingston and he was obviously a bit allergic talking about last year's All Ireland final. but you know, whether the scars are there or not is kind of immaterial because you can see that the lessons have been learned. And, you know, as Liam pointed out as well, the first game that, that, that Cork play in the Munster Championship this year is going to be against Limerick. And, you know, if they didn't go there yesterday and and show all the traits that they did, if they didn't try and match them physically and, and go after them and try to really turn the knife and win the game, you'd be going there um, in the middle of April saying, well, look, Cork don't have a chance here. You know, they've, they've kind of coughed it up to Limerick a couple of times. So I think the day was nearly more about Cork than it was Limerick. Like, it, it, it's hard not to look at it through the, the lens of Limerick because, you know, all Ireland champions losing by nine points. But I think it was really more about Cork for their own kind of um, well-being because they had all the big performances on the day. And, like, even afterwards, like, there was no great clapping themselves on the back. It was a job done when they got off the pitch. Yeah, absolutely, Rory. When you look at the the starting Limerick forwards, Colin O'Neill got 1-1. Keane Lynch got a point. Seamus Fannigan got a point. David Reedy got three points, but only one from play. That's a fair effort from a from a Cork backline that has been, you know, somewhat maligned over the last couple of years, and not maligned, but like kind of struggling to kind of settle, I suppose, on a starting six or on on a system. Um, you know, while Limerick maybe aren't firing on all cylinders at the start of the season, that's that's a pretty good performance from that defensive unit. In an area as well, Mikey, I suppose, where they would have had huge concerns as well over the course of the last couple of years and that they are quite, um, they have been very shaky defensively. They have coughed up big scores. Cork generally tend to get into shootouts and they've been content in those because they would generally have the firepower at the other end maybe to to eke out the wins. I think the, I wouldn't necessarily be pushing any panic buttons if I was Limerick either. I think Garrod Hagerty is such an important player for them just in terms of uh, ball winning ability, obviously his score, his leadership up there. Um, he was missing yesterday. Keen Lynch is on, I know Keen Lynch was hurling with Fitzgibbon, but look, there is a difference in standard. He's only really just back into the Limerick panel in the last couple of weeks. You know, look, I'm sure he, he'll settle into it. And Aaron Gillan wasn't necessarily playing to his full potential. They've still got potentially Peter Casey, will be back maybe by championship, you know. So I think there was a little bit of a fall since I think it's a good position for John Kiley in a lot of ways. His last two matches are um, awfully in Clare. Now, they'll get a test next Sunday in Ennis, certainly, but realistically, they're not going to be relegated. They're not now probably going to make a league semi-final. So John Kiley now knows that the league will finish for, for Limerick on the 20th of March and they'll play Cork on the 16th of April. And that's a four-week block of work that they'll get ready for, and I will expect a very, very different Limerick in Parky Cueve on the very first day of the Sunday game live. That's, that's, when you lay those dates out there, that's quite interesting because, Liam, um, I think we, it's, you'd have to say that this, the Limerick don't look themselves, and by no means would you suggest they're going out not trying to win games, but... You could see an instance, couldn't you, with the kind of with how how jammed in the calendar is this year. That if you know if you're one that two of the last three All Irelands, perhaps a league title isn't something you desperately crave. Whereas a four week block of work when you're the last team back after uh, for pre season could be worth its weight in gold. Yeah, look, I don't, I don't think like you know when they look back on it, like Limerick's 
Limerick will be really keen to go three in a row in all Ireland. Three yeah. in a row, such a big that, thing, that, like in Leon, yeah, isn't it? That's yeah. That's absolutely what they're what they're wired yeah. up for. Um, you know, there was seven. You know, if you look at the team yesterday, I would say the seven of them that will not get their starting jersey in the Munster Championship. So you're probably looking at half their team. Um, and I think Rory, you're right. I think ultimately they need to have Nicky Quaid in the in, in the box doing the orchestrating from the puck out, and they need to have Garrod Hegarty in the half forward line. If you look back. You know, in the All Ireland final when they played Waterford, you know, a lot of the ball is just channeled down to him. He either catches it or else they win it off the breaks. Will O'Donnell was a big player for them. And you know, when you're gone, when you're going in with a 14 point deficit, you know, it's it's a it's a long way back in in the middle of a league. Um, you know, it was going to be very, very difficult. So even though they brought on Will O'Donnell, they brought on Dermot Burns, they brought on Aaron Gillette, like that, that was there was no point, you know, there was no that was not for turning yesterday in those conditions. And you know, you just don't do that. So I don't think John Kiley will be will be overly excited. Um, you know, he's he's obviously really, really competitive. They certainly don't like losing. But you know, we've seen it last year. They drew and then they, they lost two and then they, they went, you know, they just went unbeaten. But you know, at the same time, this format is different, you know. I suppose maybe, you know, for Limerick, maybe the shorter span, you know, the last two all Ireland finals were straight knockouts. Uh, it probably suited them. They came to the table all the time. You know, if you go back to nineteen. They lost two or two matches in the round robin. They lost to um, they lost to Cork in their in their first match, and they lost to ourselves in the last match, and then they obviously lost to Kilkenny. Um, so they ended up losing three times in 2019. So they will need to get a consistency once they hit the that 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 D day sort of the start of the Munster Championship. Um, you know, you need to be firing all cylinders because lose your first match, and you know, no matter what team you are, Tip play Waterford and Cork play. Cork play Limerick. The loser of those two matches, I would say, it's nearly certain one of those won't make the won't make the uh, the cut when it comes to three teams going through. So it's it's high stakes when 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 this thing kicks off and one match in, it's all systems go. But I think that's the day John Kiley has most of all in his diaries that first round of Munster Championship. Would you have would would you put that 29, 2019 down to a performance by Limerick down to anything in particular? And because it's interesting, you say you know when you think about it, they did win two knockout All Irelands. Is is there any suggestion that their their style of play, kind of just the kind of just the high intensity of it, the kind of the work rate involved, the you know, the need for a deep panel when you're playing like the the round robin? Is there any suggestion that perhaps Limerick are you know better suited to knock out Hurland than kind of the the game heavy you know kind of round robin? Uh, I look, I think the bottom line is they didn't need they didn't need they knew they were true when they played us in the last match. So you nearly ignore the last match to be fair. It was Cork that that, that caught them. But um, you know, I, I think ha, you know, after you win in All Ireland for you know, and it's your first time in forty five years, like it's it is going to like you're coming into this the following season and you know, you probably want to be back playing in the All Ireland final. And like the reality is, you know, Kilkenny got a got a they stole a march in them in the in, in the beginning of that All Ireland semi final. And other than that, I mean they had fairly well you know, did taking care of us in the Munster final in the last 20 minutes. So, you know, they were a formidable team. Um, but at the same time, they have shown lapses of concentration throughout those the throughout lapses of season. discipline. <laughs> and lapses of discipline. Because you know, if you go if you do go down to 14 in current climate, it's a really, really difficult game to break down because teams are so well set up. And if they get that, if they get that extra man, they can they can use it really well and, and they are hard to break down. So like he has a bit to ponder um, mm. and the group is a bit to think about because um I think you know, I, I think when we got to the walking out the other final last year, we probably said, God, you know, who's going to get near to them? And I'm not saying that significantly changed dramatically, but at the same time, you're probably seeing, well, maybe there is a little bit of chink of hope uh, for the other teams. So I, I do think, you know, it's going to be a really, really interesting and exciting Munster and Inter Championship because I right now couldn't sit down and say wholeheartedly who the three out of five are going to be in either, in either province. Yeah. And that's a great place for Hurling to be in. Is um it, it was a big win for Cork and you're right um Connor we shouldn't focus too much on Limerick so so the final word then perhaps to you on Connor Lahan the uh yeah. the greatest comeback since Elvis I think at this stage that's um I know it's early in the league but he is he's he's just a uh, he's reborn like he's been brought back and he's been given an opportunity and thus far the just the style of his play and just the influence he's having on the games he's he's really grabbing it with both hands. Yeah, no, I think that's a fair point. And like there's a great variety now, like Conor Lehan will add to it now, but there's a great variety in the Cork forward line. Like they brought on um, you know, Connor Cahalan and Connolly and Harnady as well yesterday. Um, you know, Jack O'Connor has to come back into the team. He was a fella who sort of illuminated the championship last year with his pace, particularly against Kilkenny in that Ireland semi-final. So Cork have a bit of everything up front. I think the, you know, the I suppose that not the challenge, but definitely the the something that Ken Kings to be looking forward to is deciding on which particular day you know you use particular forwards because 
you know, yesterday, as we said, you know, they, they, they scored from kind of everywhere. They never tried to run in behind Limerick. They've, they've learned their lessons. And I think, like, Lahan obviously adds to that, but it, it's a much more very looking Cork attack than I think it even looked this time last year. Hmm. Um, looking to perhaps was one of the games of the day yesterday, Rory, it seems, and very dramatic finish above in Belfast where uh, Watford needed a, a fairly spectacular penalty save from Sean O'Brien to to escape um, with a win over Antrim. And after Kilkenny required a, a last-minute save from their own goalkeeper to save a win against against Antrim, <laughs> the, the Ulster team, they're... they're they're not having much luck this year, but they're certainly, they're proving themselves, there seems to be incremental improvement with Antrim. They are, they're remaining competitive and look, I mean, I know, I know they were giving out about us again last night and, and I'd accept that, but look, they're not on their own. We, we weren't able to send cameras to Offaly Clare or um, Kilkenny Leash either, so they shouldn't be taking it personally this week and hopefully they won't, but they probably will. But, um, <laughs> The, like they are remaining competitive. The one fear, I suppose, is they came up to the Liam McCarthy and they huffed and puffed and got tried to get into that competitive space as well, and then ultimately still went down. Now they're back in Joe McDonough. I I would make them favourites to come back out of that and come back up again. And um, I, like that's the fear, I suppose, um, from their point of view, is that a lot of these, if you want to call moral victories. They won't be worth much if they don't manage to get the two points against Leash next Sunday. And um, that's going to be the, I think, from Darren Gleeson's point of view and from Antrim's point of view, that's where all the eggs need to go at this point because it's vital if they want to continue evolving, continuing their progress, that they've tr- managed to try and stay in Division One hurling because uh, that will ultimately lift the, the, the calibre and the standard of their play across the board. Yeah. Um, Liam... The Watford manager, obviously, in Cal was, was widely seen to be your uh, successor in waiting when, when you um, left last summer and obviously, or at the end of last season. And obviously that hasn't come to pass. When you look at their early season form um, with a significant number of players still to come in, it's kind of easy enough to see why he why he stuck with Waterford, isn't it? And he kind of wants to see out that project because most people look at and see them, that they absolutely have the potential to win an All-Ireland with that group of players. Ah, yeah, look, I mean, you know, you've, as you said, you've decided to make your, your return home where I suppose there was probably open arms waiting for you, or do you, you want to stay where you are? So, look, he's, he's a good relationship. I'm sure it wasn't a decision that he, he made easily. Um, but, look, you know, he's made his decision now, and it should make for really exciting matches next weekend and, and the first round of the championship. There'll be, yeah. there'll be, a, there'll be a, a, you know, he's, he's got, he's got uh, Watford of, of advantage uh, in terms of home advantage in in both occasions but yeah look it's it's a big year for Watford you know they've probably been knocking on the door that you know there was probably a view that with all the matches they had they, they arrived against Limerick in the semi-final very much you know battered more so than battle hardened and um, they just had so many matches between you know Galway and ourselves and then and Leach first in Galway then ourselves and then trying to trying to get themselves um, up again for Limerick and they probably went battering them in the first quarter and I think Tedford because ultimately their energy, Limerick had loads in reserve in terms of their energy levels uh, because they were just fresher. Um, so look, it's it's a big season for Waterford. You know, Tide de Burke is back. Valley Gunner have just won. So like, there's expectation. I think outside of Waterford now that they're they're probably the closest to them. So that brings that brings its own level of weight as well. It'll be interesting to see how this group carry that. Um, so I'll be I'll be watching with interest over the next number of weeks and months. Um, but you know, again, again, like obviously. There's a, there's a Tipperary man up north as well. Um, you know, I think in terms of what they're trying to do, um, I think it's phenomenal what they're, you know, I mean, they've they've gone to Kilkenny and they've held their own uh, very close to turning them over, as you said. Uh, Dublin, who are a really, really impressive team, who I watched in the flesh on, on Saturday night and at halftime it was it was level. Even Stephen going in at halftime with Dublin and Dublin managed to get over the line, but it was a tight game. And, and again yesterday. Um, so, like, you know, it's not easy when you're more or less an hour and a half or more away from the nearest hurling county in terms of trying to get matches or trying to keep keep competition going. So I know, like I think when they went to when they went to uh, Kilkenny, I think the miners could have been an off day for the day, and the other twenties were down in Tipperary playing it. So he's trying to bring, and they all went down and watched the match. So he's trying to do something up there that isn't easy to do. Um, there's an awful lot of people, there's an awful lot of passion for hurling in in um, Antrim, but. I think last year, yes, they might have underperformed in the Joe in the Joe McDonough, but I think what Antrim had to put into the National League off the small pool of players they had 
meant that it was almost impossible for them to be competitive. I just like, like they had to use, the, like they only have that core group of players. Like they, they don't have 31, 32, 33 players that they can continue to transition players in and out. And that makes it really, really difficult. So I think the bunch are really performing. I think they're progressing. I think it's doing, re I think it's great for hurling. And I think it's great for, for, um, for Antrim people because there's, for someone that was up there for a year or two helping out, in a small way, uh, I know the passion they have for the game, and, and I just think it's fantastic to see them being competitive. But you know, for Darren Layson, I know the chap well. He's not interested in being competitive. He he'd be disappointed that he hasn't managed to get a victory or two along the way, and he's probably been close enough. I mean, look, you know, they could have easily walked away with a with a three twenty one each draw yesterday, which to me would have been a, a fantastic scoreline. So um, anyone that goes there is uh, is really having the battle through it, and and they are a work in progress, but they're making great progress, and I think. You know, the GA should look and see how they could even support that journey even more because there's loads of people up there. How do we have more than 10 hurls? Yeah. Uh, it was interesting to see Kieran Clark started on the bench yesterday. So that's the sign that they are trying to kind of blood a few more or get a few more players kind of starting in the, in these big games, which is interesting. Um, on the on Waterford, um, they, Connor, they are they're turning into the great entertainers of this league. The, the score lines are kind of they're racking up and like, you know, to talk of like the Bally Gunner contingent coming back kind of does he Desi Hutchinson etc and kind of Bennett has been shooting the lights out in the start of the league uh so then yes there's Colin Dunford's chance to turn to pop up with two goals so um it's it, it just seems like that Liam Kyle has an awful lot of options particularly in attack yeah but I, like I wouldn't even stop there Mikey like last year when Ty the Burke went down you know we were, we were expecting worse and earlier Daly came out of nowhere and I thought he was just exceptional like in a different kind of interpretation of that role you know, a very physically imposing, very positive, strong player. Um, and now they've got Ty DeBorka and Erlit Daly back there. Like Connor Prunty, you know, I think it's one of the best fullbacks around. And Connor Gleason, a brilliant man. So I suppose it's a very long winded way of saying, I think they now have a very, very deep panel. Um, and like you look at that attack that started yesterday, like Stephen Ben obviously was one of their hurlers of the year last year. And you're going to add Desi Hutchinson and Porrick Mahoney back to it now. Um, if not next week, certainly before the start of the championship. And there is an awful lot to like about Waterford. Um, like there's a reason I think that a lot of people have them after Limerick, you know, I mean, just on the basis of consistency for the past two years, there was any number of reasons they could have taken the fall last year and, and kind of faded away. And I think under Liam Cahill, whatever sort of, whatever he brings to himself and Mikey Bavens, they just, they're getting the most out of themselves at the moment. And it's hard to know what their glass ceiling is. I know that's a bit of a cliche at the moment in sport, but like it is hard to know where Waterford could go with this because, you know, talent wise and, you know, how well drilled they are as a team, how physically strong and athletic they are. Um, and like somebody like Ozzy Gleason, you know, and it was great to see how well he played yesterday and as well, Tony Kelly making his comeback for Clare. Those kind of hurlers just absolutely. And Keane Lynch, obviously on his good days, those fellas are just... You know, you, you'd pay to watch them poking the ball against the wall and, you know, like Waterford have several of those guys. So, yeah, no, I, I, I'd agree with you. I, I, any day you get sent to, to cover Waterford or, or watch Waterford play, I think, is a, is a good day at the, at the office. Uh, right, Rory, we're, we're, we're over 20 minutes into the podcast now and I haven't mentioned Wexford, so it's, it's, about, it's about time. <laughs> <laughs> they, were I've, outstand, they were outstanding yesterday, now I have to say, they really were. It was... Um, yeah, it was like we we said here, or I said here last week that you know if they're to get a win here, then you know it you know it you can kind of be it's fair to be optimistic, and it, it wasn't just a win; it was you know a six point win, um, you know limiting that Galway team to fifteen points, um, without Liam Ryan, without Lee Chin, um, and as Dar Egan pointed out himself after a match talking to Sunday Sport, you know. They had to come, they, you know, they had to show resilience in the second half because Galway got back to level scores. And I was watching, I said, ah, oh, this, this, <laughs> this is, <laughs> I can see how this is going, but not a hint of it. Galway got level, but that was the end of it. Then Wexford pulled away from them and it was, it was just a very impressive performance. Very impressive. I love watching them. I think, um, now Liam obviously knows Dara Egan very well. I think, I think, I said this last week, there's a freshness about the way they're playing. They look like, a team that, you know, has had a shot of life kind of injected into them in a big way. There's looks like there's a great spirit there. They still have a couple of players to come back. They've got a like up front. I mean, if there's a better hurler around, uh, a better forward than um, Rory O'Connor at the minute, I haven't seen him. Um, like, uh, 
like Damien Rick yesterday, like some of the things that he was doing, mm-hmm. you know, to, like just throwing himself into tackles, hook, like t- two or three different hooks and hook, hooking and hurling is something that I've kind of, it was something that I've noticed, like you don't actually see that much of it anymore. And, I'm, and I, I was kind of wondering why. Now he performed at a couple of absolute beautiful ones yesterday. And I was kind of saying, is it because there's a lot more short hand passing now in the game. Lads aren't pulling on the ball as much, and you know, there's, there's less striking as a result. I don't know. Shorter hurls. Yeah, shorter hurlies, maybe. That's true too. That that could absolutely be the case. But look, to me, they look like a team that's reborn. And um, and like they've had an absolutely like what a start to the league. I probably have them front runners in Leinster now. No, no, don't let's not get carried away. Uh, <laughs> Liam, <laughs> Liam, no, I don't, don't curse us. Liam, not, not every coach is cut out to be a manager. So I'm wondering, you know, you obviously worked with Dara for, for a few years. Would you have seen him as management potential uh, uh, material? Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. As I said, he was my understudy for all of, all of the managerial side of things. He's uh, like he's he's a school principal and has been for a number of years uh, on his own doorstep. So that tells you how. How much he is held in high esteem um, in the locality, in the community. His club, Kildangan, is in a really good place. Uh, you know, has won is one has won its county senior title and has won. You know, I think it won under nineteen, under twenty, uh, junior um, north titles. They were club of the year in the north again this year. So, like, there's a really good operating model in in um, in Kildangan and Darren was Darren, Darren not in his own now, but it was a big driving force within that. So. This guy is, uh, you know, he's, he was a great coup for Wexford, um, you know, to, to get him on board. And obviously he's got Niall Cork and he's got good people around him. Um, and he's doing a fine job, you know. And like, you know, when you looked at the fixtures, first was saying, you know, Limerick coming to town the first match and then you're away to Clare and Galway. Like, you know, you could find yourself in no points. And here he is six. Sitting, on, sitting on six points, you know. So that's that's a fantastic um, start. Um, but, you know, yourself, he, and I'm sure he's aware of it too. You know, he's probably in a really strong position now to get into a league semi-final. But, you know, that same opposition yesterday are coming down to him for the first match in the middle of April. I think Galway play Wexford in Wexford Park in the first round of the championship. And again, right, yeah. the, loser, the loser of that game is going to be under immense pressure. And again, Galway, Galway, no one. You know, Galway yesterday, you know, they, they weren't, obviously we were really impressed with them against against um, against Limerick inside in the in the Gaelic grounds. But I think, again, the man on the edge of the square that makes this goal, with, look, you know, and Rory called it earlier on, like Rory O'Connor is just an exceptional forward, you know, who's able to him. get on ball. Like the point he got yesterday that we were, broke onto his right and smacked it over the bar. Like he's just a joy to watch. You know, he made the run for the goal and even again, Clare couldn't really handle it. He's a great man to take on. But um, I think kind of... Is he right? Could, Liam, just on that, actually, it's a good point to actually make there. Is he right-handed but strikes off his left? He's very, comfortable. Like he's very he's very comfortable on either side, Rory. Like he's right, just okay. a really, really good talent. He scored one from the other sideline later in the he game, did. then off his yeah, left. Yeah, he yeah. he he does he seems to be he's like the Shane Walsh of Harlem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, he's very he's very comfortable. And you know, his his accuracy actually has gone to a new level, I think, this year so far, anyway. And I think that's very positive news for, for Wexford. But like he he needs minding now. And again, look, anytime we played him, I used to always like we played him in the in the in the All-Ireland semi-final in 2019. And I remember when he was substituted, and he was substituted about 10 minutes to go, and I was nearly going to give it a round of applause myself because I knew well. <laughs> I, well because, like, I, had Brendan, I, I had Brendan Maher posted on him. I said, Brendan, he's yours for the day now. I said, he's going to take a bit of mind it. Um, because he, he, you know, he's a really, really electric ele- electric forward. But I think Conor Whelan is the same for Galway. I think Conor Whelan makes that forward line take. Um, he's the forward that I always would be watch him and, and, and be, be very conscious of. And I think he was missing yesterday. I think he got a knock in train. Yeah. So, yeah. look, I still think it's all to play for, but I tell you, from the fella that was, you know, all I ever got was drenched wet and blown alive up there on the sideline in Salt Hill. I, I very rarely come up with anything out of it. Um, in, my last, in my last term, anyway, we played there twice, 100% record, played twice, won none. Uh, <laughs> so it's, 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 it's a hard place to win. So that's a really good step for, for Dara and for Wexford. Just. I forgot to tell Liam before we started recording that there's a ban on discussing the 29 All Ireland Hurling semi final <laughs> uh, <laughs> on this podcast. Up, Mikey, it up. <laughs> um, just finally, then uh, on, on Dara and Liam, I just thought, like, I suppose he has to be commended that he came in. Um, taking over a team which was playing for uh, David Fitzgerald, obviously, was a very, very distinctive way of playing. And he hasn't thrown that out, and he's asked about it repeatedly, and he's kind of like, no, no, we need to, you know, what we need here is a blend. You know, I'm not throwing out what they did, because what they do, what they did with Davy is excellent. They're very good at it. It's about adding other strings to their bows. So that kind of showed a maturity that he wasn't, 
it'd be easy to come in after David Fitzgerald and say, no, no, we're going to completely move away from that. But he's kind of accepted what Wexford were and kind of tried to tweak it as opposed to reinvent them. Oh, yeah. Like, Darren, Darren thinks a lot about the game. Like he's a smart he's, fella. He's very, very, he's very, very clued in. Um, you know, he's got all the, like, he's been, you know, he was probably my conduit in terms of even working between me and the, and the analysis team. Uh, Darren was probably the conduit between the two of us. So, like, that man is on, on message and he knows exactly what, where he, you know, he knows the players that's available to him and what style he sets up. Uh, and again, it's great to see, like, I mean, to see Oshin Pender uh, coming in yesterday and getting one one. Like, I mean, that guy, that guy's in a kit, you know. And like, I mean, there's a lot of guys that are you really waiting for the come to 22, 23. And here's a guy really young, no inhibitions, goes in and smacks one one. So, you no, know, Dara is, is well able to get, he's able to connect with people at all levels, whether they're young or old. And he looks to be giving them a new lease of life down there. And I think that's a very positive for Wexford. And I think you'll see that. You know, if that if that if that team of people that they have down there that with the passion come in comes in behind this team, it could be in for a very exciting twenty nineteen. That's for sure. Like really mm. important. Okay. Uh, twenty two. Yeah. As I said, I, there's I, I, I keep on mentioning twenty nineteen. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Rory, we're not having him back. We're not back. Uh, and, um, and, and just and, and just a finally, if, if you, the one thing it should be mentioned, they look like in incredible physical condition, Wexford. Now maybe they're a bit ahead of everybody else at the minute. Who knows? But like uh, in terms of their physical fitness and the shape, I mean, you know, like you're going to have to mix it with them if you're going to want to take them down. Hmm. Um, well, we'll have to leave the hurling now in a couple of minutes. And I, as I said, there was a lot of games yesterday that we're not going to get to. We're not going to get to Kilkenny and Leash. We're not going to get to Clare and Offaly here. Um, but I, you know, it's noticeable. I do have a. Uh, the Tipperary, Tipperary man here in the Dublin man, so I wanted to mention Saturday evening's game. Oh, Connor, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to let him in. I, I, I wouldn't want to contain him. Uh, Connor, you know this is you know this is year three of the Matty Kenny project, and if there weren't, if there wasn't, you kind of you know signs of growth at this stage, you would be getting very concerned. Mm -hmm. So you have to be happy. It's a it's a settled team, and they are playing like a settled team, and they are. They're winning games. <laughs> they're, they're winning games the, the every which way so far this spring. Yeah, it's actually year four now. Um, four, yeah. four, pardon me. Yeah, yes. Two of them went very quickly. But no, you're right <laughs> in saying that. I know people are you know noticing that Dublin are gone when this year, but like you had two managers in two very different positions on Saturday night. Um, you know, Colin Bonner was trying out a lot of new players. I think in the Dublin teams, there's probably 12 or 13 players that are already locked down, and most of those were playing the other night. So you know, if Dublin aren't showing signs of improvement and adapting to the way Maddie's trying to get them to play and, and you know, going to places like Torless and picking up league points and, and winning games at this stage, um, you know, you'd be, you'd be looking at it saying there might not be a whole pile there for them this summer. What's interesting, just talking about the scheduling of the start of the championship with the end of the league and, you know, because I know a few people, I know John Milan in the independent tip Dublin to, to get to the league final or, or maybe even to win the league. I think there would be a huge benefit to that for Dublin because first of all there's a lot of players in the squad who have never won anything and um, I think you'd only have Alan Nolan and Liam Rush maybe and Danny Sutcliffe back from the 2013 team that won Leinster mm -hmm. but but in previous years with the round robin when Dublin started they had Kilkenny first and then they had Wexford the following week who were coming in after a bye week so it was a very difficult start to that they had to be very in tune for those first two weeks with the way it has been rejigged two of the first three weeks this year are Leash and Westmead uh, now, not that Dublin would be going around taking Leash in particular for granted, but I think the benefits of getting to a league final and, and possibly trying to win that now would far outweigh any dangers of having to go flat out between, you know, I think there might be only two weeks between a league final and the start of the start of the champ the Leinster Championship. So, yep. yeah, I think that's a big thing for Dublin. I think Dublin are the sort of team that probably did need to go well in the league. But in fairness, they went, you know, I mean, they went in the halftime, as Liam said, they got the only... The only downside to the performance really was the last 13 minutes. They couldn't really win a ball up front. Tip put huge pressure on them. They brought on the two McGraths. Um, and, you know, obviously there was a potential goal for Jason Ford there at the very end. But the things that Dublin do well, they did well the other night. Like, Owen O'Donnell, I'm not sure if people fully appreciate how good a fullback Owen O'Donnell is because he's obviously had hamstring injuries and people haven't seen an awful lot of them. But, um, you know, he gave Seamus Callan a fair for, first night at the office. Um, I thought Paddy Smith played that number six role really well. The one that Liam Rush usually plays. They, they, they have that down to a fine art now with Connor Bork dropping back then. Um, and he kind of goes for anything on the ground and his touch is very good and his distribution is very good. Um, and then ahead of that, 
Danny Sutcliffe for the last two years has just been absolutely exceptional. Um, like whatever about how well he gets around and, and his hurling, his ability to just impose himself on the game is huge. You know, he'll 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 I know Dublin go from with a lot of ball, but he uh, he gets to it every time. I think it's a very good half forward line that they have now um with Donald Burke there as well. And even in the corner, Aiden Mellett, I think it was his first game, he won a lot of ball. I think three or four points might have come directly off him. So yeah, like the thing is ticking along nicely there from Dublin. And and I think the Dublin team that we see in the first round of the championship will be you know, you'd like to see maybe just a, a, a more advanced version of what we saw the other night. I don't think, you know, there's going to be any great surprises. There's probably only two or three players to come back into that team. So, yeah, it's a good win. Dublin don't win in Thurles too often. So when they do, they may as well enjoy it. Indeed. Um, Liam, it's... I, I don't think anybody is is particularly judging Colin Bonner as of yet because he's, you know, obviously he's... he's a, the guy who went before him left him with an awful job to do. Um, yeah. No... <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> obviously there's there's work to be done there that awful word transition but just to get your own thoughts on the thoughts uh, your the idea of putting out a, kill, a Tipperary team that didn't have either Brendan Maher or Paddy Maher in it would probably have been a scary thought for you having had so many years with the team whereas for a new manager coming in to lose those two building blocks it's not something Colin Bonner will use as an excuse but I don't think it can be underestimated how important they were oh no that's like that's absolutely true and you know Paddy there was loads of life left in Paddy's legs, so Paddy's one really unfortunate because I think he was he was ready to go again. Um, so unfortunately, you know, he's been dealt a cruel blow, and I think hurling has been dealt a cruel blow because he was such a, you know, as you said, you know, different than some of the players that Connor spoke about earlier on. Like you go to see him because uh, every time he got on the play, you know, there was something coming. Um, so look, they, you know, they are that's tough, but I think you can see what Colin is trying to do. I mean, if you look at the the last two matches, you know, Owen Connolly, Brian McGrath, Craig Morgan, Robert Byrne. Dylan Quirk, James Creeley, all these guys are, you know, hopefully some of these are going to turn into the guys that will be able to light up the summer. And he's he's given them their 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 chance. Now, look, you know, for some of the guys, you know, it was tough, tough enough because there was a, there was a big separation between half back then and full full back then at the times the other night. And Ronan, no better men than Ronan Hayes and Remac Bryden, these guys to, to take full advantage of that space. So, you know, it's it's a learning piece. So I think I think the trick that Colin will trying to do between now and the middle of April is to get that blend right between you know, the Jason Fords, the Ronan Matters and, and um, the Barry Hefflins and, and, and Dan McCormick's and all those guys that are in that cohort. You know, you'll have a sprinkling of, you know, the Knowles and the Shamies and these guys and Bonner's coming back in as well. But ultimately then it's how we can support them with the, with the younger generation because I think we know from the under, from the minors in the under 20s, there is talent in there. Uh, so I think the point is, that's the point around personnel. But I think secondly then is, how what's the best way? I think Matty Kenny knows how Dublin want to play and what style of play they want to they want to impose. I think Henry Sheffield knows that Galway have a style of play, you know, likewise in Limerick. But I think Colm has to work out how does he get his best style of play for these players that he's now going to have, which is a sprinkling of the younger guys. How, how does he best get all that to fit together? And he doesn't have long. Uh, but if there's a man to start, no better man, you know, himself and Tommy and, and Paul and, and, and Johnny are in there. And um, yeah, look, as, as Connor said, a small little thing would have turned the game. But Dublin may be on the face of it, you know, they had nine first half wides. They probably left a little bit after him, left tip in the game. Uh, I thought five points down, but when, you know, when, when Ronan Hayes and Ree McBride and Fergal Whiteley went off the pitch for, for Dublin, I think Dublin struggled. So that's an area that Matty will be concerned about because they, they really were non existent up front in the last 12 minutes and nearly cost them the game. And I think there and I think there is a bit of transition there, Mikey. Like, I mean, you mentioned the word earlier. There is. I mean, it's you know, like there's a new management, there's a lot of new players, there's maybe they're maybe they're trying to do something new in terms of how they want to play the game. So that is transition, whether you want to call it that or not. And I suppose, look, there might be what you'd probably hope for, I suppose, from to a certain extent, is a little bit of patience from the temporary supporters, but not known for their patience, Liam. <laughs> <laughs> no, but at the same time, Rory, I think there's a lot of ambition in that dressing room. I mean, that, you yeah, know, there's, yeah. there's, there's a lot of strong faith, like Rona Mahar is going to his cat, like, yeah. Rona, like Jason Ford is playing, you know, he's, he's, in, he's in mighty form. So, like, oh, there's, a really good, there's a really good core of a group there who I think are ambition, and I'd expect him to be really competitive because, yeah. you know, and, and that's like when you look across the Munster Championship, as I said right now, every team on their day will feel can beat they, the they can take the other team, and yeah. that, that yeah. makes for really, really interesting times. You, um, you just finally that you, you kind of mentioned the kind of the the blooding of the new players and that was something you heard all of last year that was pretty much the first question probably put to you after every press conference or every match sorry and um you know you did to an extent to the you know but there was a, you know there was a sticking with the old guards that well. was part of the reason for kind of not 
flooding the team with new players was it to avoid what you're talking about now that column if you if you bring in wholesale changes then you have to completely change how you play which gives you is basically two jobs of work you're blooding new players and kind of redefining your tactics so column kind of has a kind of double whammy was that what you were trying to avoid last year well we, but we had a very we had a very set style of play so we had a we had our I suppose our templates in terms of how we wanted to play and that was the same uh, no matter what personnel was in there and everybody that played knew that template so like I mean we played player in the most recent final um and we played awfully midweek the following week with the different personnel, but with the way we set up and the way we structured our team was the very same. So there was no real change in structure because we didn't ask them to play a different style of what we were based. But at the same time, when you're a new manager, you just want to put your own stamp on things in terms of how you want the team to play. And that just might take a little bit of betting in because there was times I thought the other night where you know we weren't really sure where our people were. We bang ball in, maybe back into where Dublin had the channels flooded. And, you know, fair play, as I said, Connor. Uh, Paddy, Paddy, Paddy uh, Smith played a really good job. He, he seemed to find himself where the ball was landing and, and was able to set up an attack from there. And likewise, I thought Dublin gave an exhibition of the rock ball the other night. You know, they were probably the most impressive team I've seen in a while in terms of when that ball's in a rock. Themselves and Limerick have it off to a fine art, but they hurt tipped the other night. The first goal they got came from a rock ball. You know, Chris Crummy came out of the rock with the ball, all of a sudden found himself free, offloaded to Ree McBride. And I think that goal in the first half had a big bearing in the overall result. Yeah. Okay. Look, we've. The- Sec- penultimate round of games isn't it yeah penultimate round of games at the weekend so we'll be back to preview that on thursday um liam thanks very much for joining us and we'll catch you again soon as long as you promise not to talk about 2019 is over catch you again welcome back we've been joined by pat spillan how are you pat very well thank you Good stuff. Hey, look, it was it was an exciting weekend of football. Um, it's um, the league is it's been delivering this year. Uh, there's there's storylines in in all the divisions. Mm. Glad to say Wexford put a stop to all that London nonsense. So, huh? not like not like Wexford <laughs> to end a bit of Dream romance. Crushers. We yeah, are. And I, I, I predicted a away victory as well, so I felt good about. It. Well done. We're very anti-romance in Wexford. We don't like that kind of stuff. The people's champions. <laughs> um, but we, we'll, we'll start in we'll start in Newbridge. Sorry, Connor. Um, but obviously Kildare is uh, heaping more misery on the Dubs, Pat. And um, you know, I, the one interesting thing is that you know there was there was nine of the fifteen like who who played in last year's All Ireland semi final. I think we're playing for Dublin. Um, so this isn't a wholesale personnel issue. Um, you can't say it's altogether tactics either. Is there any suggestion here that the, the dubs have just kind of lost their joy de vivre? I don't know. Do you know, it's gas in a way. The, the amount of 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 the amount of trees that have been cut down in the Amazon <laughs> rainforest for the, over the last couple of weeks to provide newsprint to talk about the demise or otherwise of the dubs has been. And and you know, I just I just. In my, I have in mind three commentators that I, one, said the reason for their decline was they're trying to work on a new kicking game. A second person suggested that they didn't really have penetration, it was about passing, that they weren't having a kicking game. And the third guy said, uh, actually, they don't care about the Dublin jersey. Now, I did, as somebody who wore a, a county jersey, I can tell you this without fear of contradiction. First of all, the pride in wearing a county jersey uh, is immense. Uh, there's a huge responsibility. There's a huge honour. And I can say this as somebody who was that soldier for 17 years with a county senior. There is no person in this country that goes out wearing a county jersey that doesn't care about their own performance, about the performance of the team and about not winning. So uh, scotch that thing about Dublin, any about attitude and they don't care. Uh, look. If you want to look at it in another angle, they butchered four goal-scoring chances and could have won the game and probably should have won the game. So if they had won that game and had taken, and there were easy goal chances, two to three of them, we'd be, we'd be having a different discussion here today. So look, uh, the, I've been, the, and I, 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 we talked about it on the Sunday game, and I may, might have talked about it in the podcast. I've been that soldier. I know what it's like to be on the road, inter-county. I was on the inter-county scene of football scene for 17 years, played in 10 all Ireland finals, a lot of finals. And, and I'll tell you this, and it's a point I made, uh, 
like the difference between GA players and, and professional sports fellas, because the more you win in professional sport, the more you get rewarded. With GA players, it's another medal. And to keep fellas motivated for to win that other medal is, is huge. And that's why the admiration I have from, had from Dublin for winning six in a row. Admittedly, they brought in a lot of two different uh, loads of impact subs, which had a huge impact on delivering the other. But the thing about it is that you start off the year, you know what's ahead of you. It's about total commitment. It's about huge sacrifice. It's about parking your life. It's about going through the pain barrier. It's about 100%. And you know when you have all those all the medals, at some stage, with both physically, there's a lot of mileage in your legs, but mentally, and I think it's mental, I think the issue with the dubs is mental. That hunger, that appetite is not what it should be. And, and it's, it's what you'd expect. But, you know, like, Forum is, is temporary, class is permanent. Would I be writing off the dubs? No, I wouldn't. Do I think the dubs will win an All Ireland this year? I don't think so either. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I have maintained over the last couple of years that I've seen Dublin team have been slipping for two to three years. I thought they were vulnerable last year, and obviously Mayo exposed them in the end. So look, I wouldn't write them off, uh, but there's, there's a lot of players to come back. But I just see. There's a tired team mentally. There's a tired team physically. Uh, there's a lot of mileage and a lot of players' legs. Uh, they have their all out medals. And, and, and it's a combination of both that physical and, and mental. Yeah, I would I would add to that maybe, or maybe it comes under the same banner, Connor, would be perhaps confidence. One of those butchered goal chances Pat mentioned was, was Dean Rock in the first half when... It does seem remarkable that he kind of shoveled off the pass when he was, you know, three or four yards from goal with the keeper to beat. It, like, Dean Rock should be the most confident forward on that team, you know, well, alongside Kieran Kilkenny. It, it does seem that perhaps they're a little bit rattled and maybe questioning questioning things they wouldn't have questioned before. Yeah, maybe. Like, my mind went back to um, the game a couple of weeks ago in Tralee when Larkin O'Dell had, mm-hmm. had Dean Rock at the back post and that hand pass that he put into orbit, yeah. which, which was the goal that... Dublin have scored so many of them. Like I would have, I've never done the stats, but I'd imagine the majority of Dean Rock's goals for Dublin are panned from Pammed, five yeah. yards out into the net. And, and that's because Dublin have always been so good at putting teams open, working on overlap, taking up the right positions um, yeah. and scoring those kind of goals. And, and they don't have that cohesion just at the moment. Um, I wouldn't be, you know, like an awful lot of the analysis around Dublin, you know, sort of presupposes that this is as good as Dublin are able to be at the moment. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't think that's necessarily the case. Like no. anybody who's ever come across Desi Farrell will know that he's an extremely kind of organised guy. Um, and I would imagine he has a very specific plan for what Dublin are supposed to be this year. And I think some of these performances are probably collateral damage towards that. Now, they still should be better. There's no two ways about that. Um, but to me, really, the, the two things that will be worrying from Desi Farrell's point of view is not really the hullabaloo about whether to be relegated or not. Um, the first thing is they seem to be st- stuck in a, in, a, in, a, in a strange gear in terms of how they move the ball. I think f- for the last three or four years, they nearly evolved themselves into, the, into a corner as a running team. And I think they're trying to come out of that um, and they're trying to have a bit of variety in their game as opposed to being either a kicking or a running team. But they revert the tide very easily at the moment when the ball isn't sticking in the inside forward line. The other thing is, like Desi has said this every week after games and he's been very consistent, the league is about finding new players. And I think, you know, the stack on round was, was 14 new players on the squad. If you take that at face value, well, in the first four games, there's literally nobody. Like the only guy that has showed that we don't already know a whole lot about would be Lee Gannon. You know, Gannon yeah. He'll be pushing yeah. towards your championship team. And Lee Gannon was the outstanding Dublin player in the 2020 All-Ireland Under-20 Championship. So he's been sort of earmarked. You know, He hasn't just appeared out of nowhere in the last little while. So that would be a cause for concern because... You know, I would trust that when the championship comes around, Brian Fenton will be back to being Brian Fenton, and so will Niall Scully, and so will Brian Howard. Brian Howard. Um, and, you know, I think the Dublin attack will probably revolve around Conor Callan, and I would imagine Cormac Costle if he gets back fully fit. fit. Um, so Dublin will be an awful lot better. But if this is a big plan from Desi Farrell, and this is sort of uh, maybe the collateral damage from that, you have to deal with consequences. And the consequences are, you know, Dublin could be relegated uh, with two games to spare unless they win their next game. Um, and that's a fairly bleak scenario. And unless you're a very, very strong-minded bunch, 
the kind of static noise around the team gets very, very loud, and it's yeah. hard not for that to infect um, the work that you do. Yeah, yeah, but um, you're, you're spot on because you know what? Like winning is a habit, and Dublin got into that winning habit. And winning habit breeds confidence in, in one's own game, one, one's teammate. It, it breeds confidence in the team. But winning a winning habit also sends out signals to the other teams that maybe you're invincible, you can't be beaten. Whereas the, on the opposite case, losing is also a habit. And it's a, it's a habit that you can easily get stuck into. But the thing about losing is losing sends out signals to the opposition. There's vulnerability there. There's weakness there. They can be got at. They're no longer unbeatable. And that's the signal that's going out to every team facing the dubs. I remember that for years with Kerry. You'd play, the, you'd play in, in the 70s or the 80s, and particularly the Ulster teams. Uh, there was many a team that we played in all Ireland semi-finals that you knew the sight of the Kerry jersey. They were beaten before the game started. And unfortunately, by the time they realised they were just as good as us. The game was gone. And there was an element of that over the last couple of years where really teams were facing the un- invincible dubs, couldn't be beaten, and played damage limitation, played within themselves. And the game was gone for them before they realised, oh, geez, we should have taken them on. We should have pushed up. So, look, the big thing I see, I see a couple of little simple fundamentals. I mean, you, you see, actually... Prof was alluded to there, they're not too sure what game plan. Should they be a passing team? Should they be a kicking, kicking team? Their transition play is very poor. Uh, the ball is not sticking inside in that full forward line. The kickouts, which, you know, I mean, Stephen Cluxton for years was, was the orchestra, was the conductor of that, of that orchestra. And his kickout strategy was so brilliant. And again, the final thing is, we talk about young talent. I've watched the Dublin Championship for the last couple of years, which is a very, very high standard. But I didn't see any young talent coming through. So, you know, uh, they had, like I said, there was two, two lots of young talent that came through during the sixth, during the sixth in a row. But that third wave of new talent, is fairly thin on the ground. Yeah. Um, on the other side, then, Rory, of course, we, the, we can't forget uh, Kildare, who become the first Leinster team to beat Dublin in a competitive match since 2010, which is, you know, it's it's kind of shocking, but not at all surprising. Um, and the way they went about it, first of all, you know, they bounced back from Kild- from the Tyrone match when they were probably, you know, uh, that, that probably took it out of them. So they showed a good bit of resolve. And, you know, in Daniel Flynn and Jimmy Highland, they have they have a wonderful kind of uh, double act inside now where the ball did stick and where there was great kind of interaction between the two of them. Like I, I felt as well the first day out in Newbridge, they, they might have let Kerry off the hook. I don't think Kerry played particularly well in that second half uh, uh, path. Like the second half, Kerry would pour it up and like Kildare could be, you know, maybe further up the table. Like I felt that certainly last day against Tyrone, they were the better side for most of the game. Tyrone were just a bit more clinical with the chances that they got and carved them open on a couple of occasions. But, like, I mean, I think it was kind of set up for them yesterday. I think they really needed to win yesterday. I think it meant a lot to them. I mean, you know, like, if there was to ever breathe any sort of life back into the Leinster football and in the, into the Leinster Championship, I think yesterday was a day where Kildare really needed to beat Dublin because... With all due respect, if they couldn't beat Dublin yesterday, you'd be really questioning yes. when they let when when it would ever. And look, they are on a high. There's a lot of good things happening. You know, they've had under 21 or under 20 success of recent in a recent vintage. There's a lot of young players out that they're after uh, putting into the side. I see Nace CBS won the Hogan semi-final by beating Jarlett 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 very very comprehensively so like you know there's a lot of good work going on in Kildare and I think they're a team that you know from my, like what you would hope is that themselves and the dubs would maintain their division one status and that division one would necessarily become a preserve for Ulster counties alone uh, would well, have been the big fear, I suppose, that the two of them would have come down replaced by Derry and you five Ulster teams in Division One. But I think the 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 bizarre situation is it's actually Dublin now who are facing the trap door, and Kildare are the ones who may have a good chance of maybe avoiding it on the back of yesterday. And the scenes that at the end you couldn't begrudge them. Yeah. I think it meant a lot. They love their football, and um, yeah, yeah, you just hope now that that was a to drive on from that them. was a must-win game. It was must-win for Kildare. They had. 
having been beaten for so many years, they had to lay down a marker. They had to take the dubs on. And if you can remember last year's Leinster final when in, in Kildare, uh, they didn't set up to beat the dubs. They set up defensively. They were all about containment. But, but laying down a marker is vital because particularly when a team is beating you on a regular basis, there, there's a sort of inferiority complex. There are seeds of doubt sown, being sown in the opposition head saying, Maybe you're not good enough. And I always remember under Mick Dwyer, we won the all Ireland in 75. Youngsters coming to Crow Park for the first time. We thought, geez, this is easy peasy. It's only a match of turning up all the time. We're a talented bunch. And of course, the Dubs beat us in 1976 final. The Dubs beat us in the 1977 all Ireland semi-final. And the Dubs also beat us in the league in 77. And that was three big games we had just lost. And certainly there was doubt. There was doubt entering our heads saying, geez, maybe they are... Maybe, maybe they are better than us. And we just, we, we had a chat together and we said, well, what's the difference between, between us and the Dubs? And the big difference we identified was the fact that the Dubs were far more physical in their approach. So, for example, when we fouled the fella, it was a push in the back or a pull of the jersey. When they fouled you, they let you know it was a, they really got stuck into you. And we felt that we were being possibly in a way bullied by the Dubs. And, and I remember we had decided, right, the next time we played the dubs, this marker, we had to lay down this marker. We had to fight fire with fire. We had to go physical with them. And the game that came up was in 1978, early 1978. It was a, uh, a fundraising game for Sister Concilio and it was played in New York. So I heard about this one. <laughs> and I, I think I, I've said this before. This was. This I heard was about this. <laughs> no doubt about it. Uh, it shouldn't have been played because the pitch was water. That's fine out. It was the filthiest game. I can tell you this without fear. <laughs> who refed it, it, Pat? Who refed it? Oh, who, it, it? If you had the United Nations peacekeeping force <laughs> uh, on duty, they wouldn't have been able to keep control because this was this. Was, I don't know how many fellas broke no, but uh, broke noses and ah, oh, it was just it was it was lawlessness. But anyway, the bottom line is we beat them, and we felt that day. Geez, we had laid down a marker. That was it. And you know what? For the next four or five years, we were in the ascendancy because we just... And that was why yesterday, just in terms of psychological, that's a brilliant marker for Kildare to lay down. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll move on to, uh, to, to, to matters in Inner Skeen. Connor. have we seen, have we seen the, the, the first shot in the demise of the, of the sweeper, keeper, fly keeper? Or did Rory Began just come out a couple of times too often... Uh, playing against a very strong breeze. <laughs> um, I hope it's the demise to some extent because, um, like, I mean, the, the thing about the sweeper keeper coming out is that, like, part of the beauty of it is that, uh, or part of the effectiveness of it is that people aren't expecting it. So you have a player come up the pitch that you don't really have a plan to mark. But I was in Clonus when when Mayo beat uh, Monon a couple of weeks ago, and and Rory Began must have came off his line about fifty times and came into the opposition's half simply to create another body uh, like in a fairly static attack so so maybe even Monon could create overlaps um but the problem with that is like it, it ceases like the risk reward thing there gets very very skewed because if you're 80 yards off your line um you know unless you're actually going to contribute to a score i don't know what you're doing up there and there was another kink in that game as well where when Monon were playing the ball inside their own 14 a couple of times mayo actually marked begging they stood with a man beside him and because the man and full back line are so used to having Began as their out ball, they were automatically looking to him. And when he was marked, they were nearly fumbling the ball looking for somebody else to give it to. So I suppose the point that I'm making is that Began and Monon are obviously the most extreme example of this. And anything that works for long enough in Gaelic football will be seized on by opposition teams. Um, and Kerry did a good job of keeping a man up there all the time as well. So that if Began went the other end of the pitch, you didn't necessarily have to lob him and put it in the goal. You only had to put it in the opposition's 14-yard line. And with the sort of kickers that Kerry have around that part of the pitch, you're always going to get that in. But um, is it the end of it? I don't know. Like, Niall Morgan was lobbed in Killarney last year and Tyrone were absolutely incinerated. And by the time the championship came around, he was back pressing opposition's kick out. So um, I'm sure it'll force a rethink, but whether it actually... Uh, whether it actually has any material effect on whether Began or other goalkeepers do the same. Like, Eaton Rafferty played in goals yesterday for, for or Saturday night for Armagh, and mm -hmm. that's not something we've seen before. So it's clearly a thing that every inter-county manager at the moment is considering whether to use or not. 
Yeah, as a as a former football <laughs> goalkeeper, I can only say football jobs for fo- or goalkeeping jobs for goalkeepers. You know, this you're, is you're right, an Mike, endangered because, species. Because unless the three blind mice have been analysing Monaghan's games, every fool in the parish knows Rory Began spends an awful lot of his time out the field and and in possession. And Kerry did their, did their homework yesterday. They identified Rory Began being on the ball and they were ready to pounce. And like I said, they forced the turnovers. They had a player up the field. They had an outlet ball. Uh, look, for years, I, I've watched the evolution of, the, of, of this uh, sweeper, keeper or outfield goalkeeper. And like, I, I was always biting my lip because I thought this is a stupid idea, but I can't say it because I'll be accused of <laughs> I'll be accused of being uh, living in the past. Uh, yeah. I don't know the usual. But you haven't a clue. This is what modern coaching is about, and this is what the modern game is all about, and this is yeah. about. Uh, blocking the space from the opposition's kick out. It's about overlaps. It's about taking the ball to the. And you're sort of saying, hold a minute now. Uh, 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 hold a minute now. Uh, a goalkeeper's first job, his primary job is to stop goals. That's his primary job. If he was flipping that good out the field, he'd be playing outfield. You know, he wouldn't be playing in goals. He's, he's there for a purpose. Uh, and I just think it's been all. Oh, Yes, as a once, once in a game, maybe twice in a game, an unexpected move, a, a, a bit of variety. I can see that. But they're all coming out now. And I just think, I swear to God, my idea is that these guys are on ego trips because they're on a powerful adrenaline fucking push. The crowd are baying and they're yahooing and he's loving it. And they're all starting to go, yahoo and yahoo. And we're up the field and away we go. Look, the bottom line is, Two, the goalkeeper is there to stop the shot. That's number one. Number two, as Duxon, their kick-out strategy is vital. But number three, there's an aim A sweeper-keeper is not a guy who comes beyond the half of that. A sweeper-keeper, the original idea, is you sweep behind your full back line and you're covering that, that area within four, 13, 14 metres. So uh, believe me, uh, there'll be a lot more... Uh, Opponents will have taken something out of Kerry's uh, game book yesterday and will be targeting, particularly Rory Beggar, to lesser extent Niall Morgan, but mm-hmm. all the all the Lulas that come running out on that adrenaline rush because I think it's... Pat, I don't I, see... I'm, I'm astonished, Pat. It seems that you were actually sitting on an unpopular opinion and didn't want to share it until it became the consensus. Uh, it's very well, unlike you, Pat. <laughs> yeah. well, well, do you know, I was thinking this today, do you know, Mikey, I said, I'm sitting here at my kitchen table, do you know, uh, and I'm offering my opinion, and I'm minding my own business, but but I'm offering my opinion to a few people here on screen uh, on Gaelic football. And you know, I was thinking about what Larry McCarthy spoke about at, at, at Congress about social media. I know that once this thing is published, 100, 200, 300, 400, or you make up your own number, will be abusing me on social media because of my comments today. Anonymous keyboard warrior. So you're sort of saying, mm. Gee, you know, sometimes if I said today was Monday, Twenty uh, percent will agree with me. Forty percent will disagree with me, and the other forty percent will say I'm, I'm out of touch. I, I'm an old man. I'm out of touch with reality. <laughs> Things have changed. So you know. So, so yeah, can you I understand mean, why sometimes I just bite my lip I and can. I said maybe I'll just say today know, is I, Monday. I'm just surprised to hear it, Pat. R- That's Rory, my rant out of the way, any as well. Um, Rory, the, a fact then. Um, we could we could drool over the uh, Kerry attack, and we, we often do. But oh, in yeah. in four games so far, they've conceded two goals and forty points, which makes about an average of just over 11 points per game um you know we, we, we were talking about uh much maligned defenses in the hurling show as well the cork defense in the hurling show uh in the hurling part of the show have it, they because... conceded two goals sorry mike have they conceded two goals uh, they conceded two goals my stats say they have but i could be lying to my, you, my stat says my stat says that in seven matches this year they've conceded no goal from open play Fact check. Uh, fact check. Okay, yeah, bear with me now. Fact check. That Second, could be can... correct, yeah. I think they have tightened up big time in the defensive yeah. capacity. You know, I think that was obviously something. Jack okay, they conceded a penalty. penalty. That's still a goal yesterday, Pat. Seven matches, no goal from open play. Ah, yeah, but I'm not talking about open play. I'm talking about <laughs> and where any, is this... any play. So, Mikey, where is this phantom second goal from? Uh, bear with me, Calder. Yeah, but no, there was no there. second goal. Ah, but there you go. They, That's they, even they, better. They've, <laughs> tight, they've tightened up. They've tightened up significantly, and it was an area that he had to go after because obviously they were a little bit porous at the back. But 
and and he still has uh, he still has like no the one thing I'd say is that one wouldn't be and again I'd be interested in Pat's view. I wouldn't necessarily say that that's too far off what you will see from a Kerry's Championship team, bar maybe Gavin White yeah. and possibly Paul Ganey. Or David I think Moore. that will be certainly yeah it will uh, yeah that'll be twelve anyway of Kerry's Championship starting fifteen. Yeah. That we saw yesterday, which always gives you an indication Please. of how serious Jack O'Connor takes the league. And he obviously wants to bed in a good system and he's got them flying it. Look, I think I said this at the very, very beginning before a ball was kicked. Whoever, whoever beats Kerry will win whatever prize is on offer this year. And if think, somebody does manage to. Sorry, yeah, Robert. if somebody. I think they've only, I think he's only started 23 players in this year's league, Jack. Um, and I think most of the other managers were up around 29, 30 after yeah. the weekend. And he's only handed out two or three debutants as well. So, like, he, he he's obviously, whatever sort of mentality he's putting into care yeah. at the moment, he's not throwing jerseys around the guys just for showing yeah. up, you know. Like, everybody has to earn their place on that team. And, like, like you, you there's probably you know, eight forwards at the moment that could start for carrying the championship and six, like it'll be some rotations, the six of those, maybe Paul Ganey and Tony Brosnan are playing for one spot up front or so many. And then obviously what happens in midfield when David Moran comes back, but it's a very concentrated bunch of players that he's obviously trying to get into the habit of beating all the teams they're going to need to beat. And to that end, it's been really successful. And the thing about it, just on the point of their defence, you know, partly Jason Foley has been really good back there as a marking defender along with Thomas Sullivan, but partly Kerry are dominating the ball. They're putting huge pressure on anybody trying to run through the middle. Um, and like the majority of Division One Gaelic football teams, you know, doubling up until this year, especially Mayo, they're going to run the ball at you. And Kerry have become very, very good at, at stopping that off its source and making sure that their full back line doesn't come under any sort of great pressure. Uh, that's I, I, actually... <laughs> Do you actually think David Morden will come back into that team, Pat, considering all that? Um, David Morden was the best centre fielder in this year's championship, in Kelly's, in last year's Kelly Club championship. Uh, has he got 70 minutes for Crow Park? I don't think so. I think I think I could see David Morden being used in a role that Mayo are using for, for, for Aidan O'Shea. Game management, closing out a game for the last 15 minutes. Uh, can I just, just refer to Connor there? Maybe uh, wearing my family hat, I'd better let me speak up to say there's probably three players going for that final spot in the full forward line. That's Paul Ganey, uh, Tony yeah. Brasson and Killian Spillane. So it's just Killian already in the team. You're the one who was telling me he was going to get again. <laughs> I, I think the final position in the corner forward is for the three. But yeah, you're right about Jack. Like Kelly's record is very impressive. Twelve league games unbeaten. That's the two league titles in the bag. One shared with Dublin. They're they're working. They're close to full strength. They are very close. You could even say it's thirteen of the team. Defensively, yes, they're doing very well. Why are they doing very well? Uh, their work rate off the ball is very good. They're tackling their swarm defence. Their turnover count is very impressive. And my own club man, Tyg Morley, he's now playing centre-back, but he's playing a very interesting sweeper role, covering that full-back line. And Tyg mightn't be the best man marker, mightn't be brilliant in the air, but what Tyg is very good at, he's a very intelligent player. He's a very good reader of the game, and he's closing out off that space. And he was spectacular yesterday, along with Diamond O'Connor. There's two things, I, I, like I, 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 as a note of caution. One, the, 20, the 12th of June, 2021, Kerry beat Tyrone by 16 points. Uh, and, and everything in the garden was rosy. And the all you know, we were already thinking of the victory parade through Tralee and Killarney. Uh, and, and that's, that's a, a note of caution. The second thing, you know, that I, I, I look at, and I just worry, and it was something Eamon Fitzmaurice was talking about today in, in the paper, uh, and you look at their timetable, and after the league final, Kerry have five weeks of a gap. Five weeks of a gap. Now, that's, that's a long gap. If they win the Munster semi-final, they'll have three weeks of a gap. And if they win the Munster final, they'll have four weeks, possibly, to the quarterfinal. And what, what worries me in that is I think back to last year, between the Munster final and the delayed semi-final, that by the time the four weeks had elapsed, that extra two weeks, Kerry didn't come out well out of that four-week break. They were either overcooked, which I don't think they were, but I think they were undercooked. So how Kerry will utilise that time if they do get into those stages, it'll, it'll be a thing. But it, look, it's, it's, it's almost a full-strength team. Uh, 
there's huge competition for places. The players are really give it all for Jack. And, and, and I agree with Connor. It's surprising he's not giving more fringe players game time. He sort of has <laughs> decided who his 17 or 18 are, and he's rotating around that 17 or 18. Right. I'd be surprised if they lose a match this year, Mikey. Okay. And they've only conceded one goal so far for the record. In seven goal. matches. None yes. from play. None from play, yes. Thank you. Thank yes. you, Tala. We've clarified it. <laughs> and by the way, and by the way, uh, and by the way, the penalty yesterday, I, I swear to God, did you see it? It shouldn't have been yeah. awarded. It shouldn't have been awarded. It was allegedly for Tyg Morley touching the ball on the ground. His, oh, yeah. hands, his hands weren't within two feet of the ball. Oh, yeah. It was cr- crazy. But anyway. Sorry, correct. Kerry have conceded no goals so far. I, I'll go on that. Um, we'll move on. Rory, um, we'll, we'll kind of breeze through a couple of points now, but uh, Pat mentioned him there, actually. Aidan O'Shea kind of um, yeah. perhaps we're seeing a new role for him himself and Padraig O'Hora came on for the second half against uh, against Armagh and it might be dramatic to say they turned the game because Mayo were very much in the game, but O'Shea's influence and the impact he had w- was was quite remarkable really you know and it does seem a man of his power and size you know kind of explosiveness coming on halfway through a match can kind of throw the opposition and uh, it could be the way forward for James Horn. It might, it might actually release uh, Aidan O'Shea to kind of get a little bit more out of him as well and I think the big thing maybe pre-season was when <clears throat> the, he was relieved of the captaincy I think, I think it was Eamon Fitzmaurice who probably pointed out correctly so uh, initially at that point when that happened, that, that may have been a precursor for James Horan to start looking at Aidan, using an Aidan O'Shea in a different way. And I think that, that can be a clever use by a manager as well. A player who has a lot of football played. I often find, and I've said this before about somebody like James McCarthy, that like when they start hitting 31, 32, you've got to start minding them physiologically. And if you do, you might get another really two or three good years out of them. But if you keep expecting them to go to the well in the same way that they that they have ordinarily been throughout their entire careers, the engine will blow a lot sooner and you might only get 12 months out of them before effectively they aren't cut out for that level of football, that type of fitness. So I think it's a smart move from James Horn's point of view. I think Mayo have been like... Mayo are just Mayo, aren't they? There's just something, like, that, to me, the only time Kerry, I think, could, could possibly get caught in this league is maybe in Tralee in two weeks' time. You know, like, Mayo coming down to town, it would be very Mayo-like to, you know, come down and put in a performance. But still, I think, you know, yesterday, if you look at the way they dug that out, massive crowd, big atmosphere again, huge following, bandwagon is up rolling, J- no Jason Darty. No Killian O'Connor, no um, Tommy Conroy. Obviously getting two of those three back fairly soon. Plenty of depth on the panel. Brendan Harrison still to come back into that defence. You know, I think Mayo are in a good place. Like, uh, given, I suppose, the fact that the most recent All-Ireland final defeat is arguably the most harrowing for them to have made th- this kind of recovery in such a short mm. period of time is very commendable on their part. Um, for for Arma. Uh, Connor, it's a, it's a first defeat, and and, and Geezer, he wasn't he wasn't happy with it. I don't think he was putting it down to skill or physicality or Mayo particularly. Kind of, he seemed to suggest like that Arma were were just not kind of clued in, which is you know they're probably not the first team to have that problem with Mayo. You think you're not clued in? It's just whatever kind of Mayo do to a team, but um, I, like their their early season momentum was so stark, so so striking that I suppose there had to be kind of a, a slight slowdown, but um. You know, there was no shame in how they lost that came to Mayo yesterday, I suppose, is my point. No, possibly not. But, I mean, I think the speed that Armagh started the league, it was inevitable that they, you know, other teams would catch up. And I think the ideal situation for McGinney would be that if the other teams didn't catch up until after the final whistle uh, yesterday. You know, <laughs> because, you know, like they had they had the beat in the Mayo, like technically it's an away game, obviously it was in the high. So, if, you know, I don't know what the, te- the technical uh, around that is. But, um. I, I suppose at this level, and I know Armagh were Division One North last year, so technically they were in Division One. But like, there's a big difference between being better than the team for 70 minutes and being a point ahead when the final whistle is blown. And that was a very harsh lesson that they learned yesterday, and one that I would imagine would sting quite a bit because they got off to the perfect start with that goal. Um, their football was direct. Physically, they're a match for anybody. But um, 
Mayo are, I saw this up on Clonus as well, they're absolutely relentless. Um, they won't stop doing what they do until the final whistle. You could set your watch to how they run the ball from their halfback line. They have the best collection of explosive and ball carrying halfbacks. I think. Erkin, Mullen, Cheney, like Yeah, and like, oh, McLaughlin's going to come back there as well. Yeah, yeah. And I know he's only came to come on, but to me, yeah, Ryan O'Donoghue, he, he's, he's, he's now one of the better in, inside forwards in the country. But for me, the find of the year for Mayo was Porrick O'Hara because for years they had full backs who would go in there and play football and get caught out. But he has that sort of confidence. He looks like a very, you know, if your full back is a very kind of psychologically strong character as well as quite confrontational and abrasive, it radiates. Like, look what Rory O'Carroll did for Dublin for years. And it's happy great. enough in a 1v1 as well, ah, isn't he? Yeah, Probably. every single yeah. time, you know, every single time. And for me, like, there's a big thing about Mayo that I was looking for this year is Dermot O'Connor. Three, four years ago, Dermot O'Connor looked like he was going to become one of the outstanding footballers yeah. in the country. And I, I, I think, I know he's he's had bits and pieces of injuries, but I was always sort of wondered were Mayo using him in the right way because... For a fella who's so big and agile, he has a really top class end product, like, you know, in terms of his distribution and his scoring. And I always felt that his talent was such that Mayo nearly needed to use him in the same way that Kerry used Sean O'Shea or Dublin used Kieran Kilkenny, that nearly every attack gets channeled through him at some stage. But he is starting to show that or certainly has yeah. done for the last few weeks. And for Mayo, that is overwhelmingly a good thing because he's an outstanding footballer. Yeah, uh, we'll have to finish up now in a minute. And there's a lot we could discuss. You know, obviously the Derry's continued march to Division One carries on. Division Three looking to be very, very interesting. You could throw a tea towel over six teams in Division Three in terms of promotion. But uh, the last word I would just want to give it to you, Pat, on the 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 mystery of Gaelic football that is this Duddy Gall team and what what are we to make of them? <laughs> I don't. I can't figure them out. I really can't. I'm not even going to try. I thought they were dead and buried. You know. Uh, uh, it was one of the worst displays ever given by Donegal team down in Kilarney. They were absolutely inept, uh, particularly when faced, when the first 20, they were fine. They were keeping possession and they had their bodies back. But then they didn't seem to have a plan B because when they had the wind in the second half, they couldn't push on. They had no long ball game. There was no leadership. There was no nothing at all. So the one thing I will say, you know, that was a huge, huge victory for them at the weekend because these boys got a lot of criticism over the over the week. Uh, lack of leadership, uh, mentally they'd have been down. Uh, this was a big, big game. And the youngsters showed, they, they put their hands up, they showed leadership. They worked very, very hard. I mean... I get, like in the first half, you would have said, this is Tyrone's game. Tyrone managed the game so well. Their game management in the first half against the wind was brilliant. And in the second half, uh, just Johnny Gall took over. And it was a very, very impressive display. Oshin Gallen back. I love him. He's a class act. Uh, but, but, but then, like, which Johnny Gall will turn up? I, I, I think this is a Donegal team. While the youngsters are coming through, they're a team in transition. And I don't think, I don't know, I can't see Donegal... They might win an Ulster, but again, I think they'll still be falling short in the last four. Yeah, they're, they're Rory, there was obviously our TV game, and um, mm. it, it, it was entertaining. It wasn't as entertaining as that punter who stood in as the third pundit. Um, <laughs> he's, following us. he's following us around. <laughs> he made some great, he made some excellent points. <laughs> <laughs> Watch your back, Pat. Um, <laughs> but uh, <You> need. <laughs> it, it, it was it was entertaining and like. You know, they are finding a few players. And obviously the big thing for most people is that they managed to win a game without Michael Murphy on the field, which was beginning to look impossible over the last couple of seasons. Yeah, I, I, and like uh, people were probably right in their app. It's half at half time, given the fact that they had played with the wind. But again, you know, we probably should have copped it. The fact that playing into the wind isn't that much of a yeah, better. disadvantage. <laughs> sorry, just Rory, on that point. In yeah, all sorry, games, Connor, yeah. In all, all the games we've been at so far this year, there's been huge wins. Like I was at um, Galway and Mead in Pear Stadium. I was at Roscommon and Clare in the Hyde. And in every single game, the team that has played against the wind has played better in both halves. Because most of the teams run the ball now. And you could see yeah. on a couple of occasions, teams that have the win for the second half and it's starting to dawn on them, oh no, we're going to have to kick the ball here. And the thing about kicking the ball with a 30 kilometer tailwind is that it's very hard to be precise, particularly when you've got sweepers and all that sort of movement ahead of you. Mm -hmm. And I think this, particularly for a team like Donegal, will run the ball at all costs. 
Um, yeah. Playing yeah. into the wind is nearly an easier way to do it. But yeah, like, John, like, like, go, go, John B. Keane, sorry, Rory. John, sorry, B. Keane's, John B. Keane's advice to fellas playing against the wind is he said, keep the high balls low into the wind. <laughs> yeah, sure, like Gooch was on yesterday with us and he said if Donegal had would have had a choice they probably would have played into the wind in both halves yes <laughs> and they're actually eight. sorry I was in Turles yeah. I was in Turles on Saturday night where uh, Tipperary were playing Slagga I swear to God I, I remember walking I was walking down to the ground and I was walking into an absolute headwind then I turned the corner to go left and I headed into another headwind it was the only match I've ever seen where the wind I've oh, never yeah. seen a wind like it. It was circling around and round. Uh, you looked at the flags on the far side of the pitch and they were going one direction and the flags mm. on the near side were going full belt in the other direction. Oh, it was a, uh, it's a it was huge a factor. Of- like, and, and Gooch is making a point like that <clears throat> Donegal's plan A is run the ball and plan B is run the ball harder. And the, so when we got into the second half, should we have been surprised? I just thought they looked slightly dispirited in that first half. And that's probably what the most surprising aspect was. I mean, the Ryan McHugh inside in the full forward line, I'm not so sure if that really worked. Did no. it really did no. it make did it make much of a difference? It's hard to say, it's particularly given the fact that they did run the ball so much in that second half, what kind of an impact he may have had if he was further out the field. Now, look, he took Conor Myler out of the game, but I don't even know how much Conor Myler offers to run in an, in an offensive capacity. So I'm not even too sure, you know, what, what the benefits on that were. But I think from their point of view, I think that will definitely lift their spirits, given the fact that they have a very proud record at home. They haven't been beaten in Ballybuff Buffet in 12 years. Um, they were definitely staring over a cliff. And I think for them to come out in the second half and play the way that they did showed a lot of cojones. Uh, the one, I suppose, negative from the whole night. And it was a fantastic, I thought it was a brilliant game. I loved it because Tyrone played some great stuff in the first yeah. half as well. But Did the one negative, I suppose, was that. And I, and I, when I saw it, I said, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a broken arm, 100%, because I knew long stoppage, um, which was a dreadful, dreadful injury to that poor lad, Podrick McNulty. Um, and you just hope that he's okay. Yeah, it didn't look great. Um, on that note, we might have to leave it. And I just uh, finished, you know, like we three ahead. three individual performances over the weekend in terms of scoring that should be highlighted. Sam Mulroy in Louth's victory over Westmead, 11 points from threes. John Hestlin in the same game that they were beaten, one goal and 10 points, seven points from three. And Keith Burden, who's a serious talent for, for Leitrim, scored 12 points. Was it 12 points or 11 Scored 12 points for Leitrim, seven from play. You know, these are guys that are serious players that sometimes don't get the limelight or the spotlight that we if they would if there was a transfer market, those three buys would be in the forward line of any of the top three or four counties. Plenty of jobs in Cork, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> I think there'll be even more coming up shop in the next year. <laughs> no one won't write cock off at all yet. Uh, thank you very much to Pat and to Connor and to Liam earlier and of course to Rory and uh, we'll be back with you on Thursday to have a look ahead to a hurling only weekend so you've got the weekend off Pat we'll uh, see you all again then we earned it by winning the last two matches on the road and that's not going to be taken away from us what I love in hurling I love players that will never give in he hits it he hits it it's over the bar oh holy Moses